Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lori Zahelka, a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago office and a member of the firm's employment litigation and counseling practice. Joining me today as co-presenter is Maritoni Kane. Maritoni is counsel in the Chicago office and a member of the firm's employment litigation and counseling practice. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping announcements. First, as we go along, we hope that you'll ask questions by using the Q&A panel on the right side of your screen. We'll make every effort to answer questions towards the end of the webinar. However, if, you, if we are unable to answer your question during the presentation, we'll follow up with you directly once the webinar has ended. Second, regarding CLE credits, we will be providing an alphanumeric code at some point during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credits, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Finally, I have one caveat. The views that Maritoni and I express today are our own and should not be attributed to our firm or our clients. And with that, we'll get started. So today we're going to talk about reducing legal risk related to trade secrets and other confidential and proprietary information at two stages in the employment relationship. The first stage is what we're calling the courting phase, or when you hire an applicant. The second stage we're calling the breakup phase, or the point where a company's relationship with an employee ends. With regards to the hiring stage, we'll focus on avoiding legal risk associated with hiring employees that may have trade secret or confidential information belonging to a former employer or who is subject to restrictive covenants. With regard to the end of the employment relationship, we'll discuss steps that employers can take at the start of that employment relationship to protect their confidential information as well as actions to consider immediately before an employee leaves the company. And finally, we'll wrap up our discussion today with possible avenues for proceeding when an employer discovers that an employee has left with confidential or trade secret information or otherwise is in violation of a restrictive covenant. With all the technological advances being made today, restrictive covenants and protecting against the misappropriation of information are more important than ever. And it's increasingly the case that misappropriation cases relate to proprietary technological advances that have astronomical monetary value, making protection of that technology crucial. Just as an example um, of a current, current affair, Google affiliate Waymo recently filed a lawsuit against Uber alleging that a former Google engineer secretly downloaded thousands of proprietary Waymo files related to its self-driving vehicle efforts. This former engineer ultimately became an employee of Uber and as the engineer in charge of Uber's self-driving car efforts. Waymo filed, among other claims, a Defend Trade Secrets Act claim against Uber. And that case is, is currently pending and still developing. The DTSA's remedies, if Waymo is able to obtain them, could potentially put a temporary halt on Uber's self-driving car efforts during the pendency of the lawsuit. And that obviously could have a significant impact on Uber's ability to be ahead of the market in this particular area. And under the right circumstances, Uber could be required to pay royalties on a going forward basis for any gain that it obtains by uh, using the allegedly misappropriated trade secrets. And that also could amount to a significant amount of money. So we'll have to see how that lawsuit plays out, but the point is that when a company's trade secrets are misappropriated, or when a company hires someone who had access to a competitor's trade secrets, the consequences have the potential to be staggering depending on what kind of technology is at issue. So it's important to have the appropriate protections in place. With that, I will turn it over to Maritoni. Thanks, Lori. So the courtship phase. One recruiting company reported that it found that fewer than half of companies and business leaders use objective criteria to make talent decisions. So what do they rely on? Reputation in the field, cultural fit, profitability potential, and just because. And when there's this attraction and infatuation with a particular candidate, 
combined with the fact that talent, especially at the senior levels, is scarce, sometimes companies and businesses, business leaders forget to do diligence into the less exciting aspects of the candidate. Analogizing this to a relationship, my husband and I always joke around that we should have done more diligence on each other before we got married. There was attraction and infatuation in the beginning, but we met in law school and never did any diligence as to how much debt each other had with regard to student loans. Now, our negative balance sheets <laughs> didn't end up negatively impacting our relationship, and we've been married for 22 years. But in the business context, not doing your due diligence on a candidate and investigating and addressing restrictive covenant issues can lead to problems, and major ones at that. And I'll pass that to Lori to start discussing these. Yes, thank you, Maritoni. So we'll turn now to the risks associated with turning a blind eye to restrictive covenant obligations that an applicant may have to his or her former employer. And those risks primarily fall into two buckets. There can be liability for the employee and the employer for liability, excuse me, under federal and state trade secret misappropriation laws. And then there can also be liability for various state common law claims like breach of contract, tortious interference, and unfair competition. Before we get into those, um, those claims, I thought I would, um, this slide puts, puts the legal risk in, in perspective, I think. It shows a breakdown by federal court and state court of who defendants are in trade secret litigation. And the most notable thing about these statistics is that the vast majority of alleged misappropriators are a company's employees. In federal court, you've got 59% of employees, or 59% of defendants are employees, rather. And in state court, you've got 77% of defendants are employees. So turning now to the causes of action that can be in play when hiring an employee who has trade secrets from a former employer. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, we'll first discuss the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Um, this, this statute was enacted just about a year ago in May 2016, and it provides a way to get trade secret misappropriation claims into federal court even if there isn't diversity jurisdiction, which can be appealing for many reasons. Um, before we get into the specifics of the statute, the one thing that I've noted here on the slide to be aware of is that the DTSA um, it requires that the trade secret at issue must be related to a product used in or intended to be used in interstate or foreign commerce. And that's one difference between the DTSA and many of the state trade secret laws and um, is likely satisfied in many situations, but it is something to be aware of uh, when thinking about uh, uh, liability under the statute. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, so thinking about the components of a uh, Defend Trade Secrets Act uh, uh, liability and the remedies that are uh, available, um, we most often see trade secret cases with both state law and federal law claims asserted. And what's notable about the um, DTSA is that it specifically says that it doesn't preempt state law. And so while there isn't a lot of decisional case law out there on the DTSA yet, most of the cases that we've seen brought that have DTSA claims also bring state law claims, and courts have generally analyzed the two claims together without really differentiating between the two as far as substance is concerned. Um, but what's most notable about the DTSA has to do with procedural and remedial issues. Um, so to begin with, uh, we'll talk about remedies available under the DTSA. And, and those remedies include damages for actual loss, unjust enrichment. Uh, in certain circumstances, a plaintiff can get a reasonable royalty. And there are also uh, exemplary damages available. And you can recover attorney's fees in prevailing parts if you're a prevailing party under certain circumstances. Those don't really differ too much from what's available under state trade secret law, but uh, the DTSA also provides for civil seat 
seizure, which authorizes courts in certain limited circumstances to issue an order without notifying the defendant that allows law enforcement to seize the allegedly stolen trade secrets. Um, and so there are a lot of there are a lot of requirements that a plaintiff has to meet in order to be able to get this remedy, but it is available uh, if the circumstances are right. Injunctive relief is also available under the DTSA. However, there are a few caveats with respect to that, and and they're particularly relevant in the employment context. So injunctive relief under the DTSA cannot prevent a person from entering into an employment relationship. The injunctive relief may also not place conditions on employment that are based only on information that the person knows um, instead of actual evidence of threatened misappropriation. And so this, this particular uh, prohibition on injunctive relief has to do with the inevitable disclosure doctrine where um, sometimes uh, plaintiffs are, in, are able to obtain uh, injunctive and other relief by saying, well, by virtue of the fact that this employee had a particular job when he or she worked with me and learned all of this know-how, given the new position that this person is taking, it's just inevitable that the person is going to use all of this know-how and, and confidential information from his or her employment with me in this new job and, and that the person should therefore be prevented from working for the new employer. That is not a basis for injunctive relief under the DTSA, although as I said previously, the DTSA does not preempt state law, and that is a viable theory depending on the jurisdiction that you're in under state law. And then the final um, caveat with respect to injunctive relief under the DTSA is that it cannot otherwise conflict with a state law prohibiting restraints on the practice of a lawful profession, trade, or business. So the most notable example there is um, in California, non-competes are, are unenforceable, and so uh, the DTSA could not, uh, you couldn't get injunctive relief under the DTSA that would be in conflict um, in a jurisdiction where California law was applicable. And then the, the other um, few notable things about the DTSA is that it, prov it specifically provides for protection of, tr of the trade secret at issue during litigation, um, provided that a plaintiff can clearly identify what information should remain confidential and why that information should remain confidential. The, co a court is, the DTSA obligates courts to uh, allow that information to be under seal and not disclosed under any circumstances, which is a little bit different than um, before the DTSA's enactment. It was always a little bit of a question as to whether or not and under what circumstances courts would um, allow that information to be placed under seal. So this um, allows trade secret owners the opportunity to defend their trade secrets with a little more confidence that they won't be exposed to the public if they, if, if they go forward with litigation. The DTSA also provides for increased criminal liability in the case of trade secret misappropriation. And then finally, um, the DTSA provides immunity to individuals for certain trade secret disclosures. And those really fall primarily into three buckets. First, um, an individual can get immunity for disclosure of a trade secret if the disclosure is made in confidence to federal, state, or local government officials or to an attorney, but the disclosure has to be solely for the purpose of reporting or investigating a suspected violation of the law. There is also immunity for disclosure of a trade secret if it's in a complaint or other filing in a lawsuit or other proceeding, provided that the trade secret is filed under seal. And then there's also immunity for individuals who file a lawsuit for retaliation by an employer uh, for reporting a suspected violation of law by the employer. In this circumstance, the employee can disclose the trade secret to his or her attorney and can use the trade secret in a court proceeding if any documents containing the trade secret are filed under seal and the individual does not disclose the trade secret except pursuant to court order. 
On a related note, these DTSA immunity provisions also contain a notice requirement, which states that employers have to provide notice of these immunity provisions in the DTSA and any contract or agreement with an employee that governs the use of, tra of a trade secret or other confidential information. So we're talking about things like individual confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements or any confidentiality policies that might appear in an employee handbook. Now, the consequences for not providing employees with notice of the DTSA immunity provisions is that an employer cannot be awarded exemplary damages or attorney's fees in any DTSA action against an employee to whom notice was not provided. So it's important to keep this notice requirement in mind, not only to preserve a company's ability to pursue these remedies against an employee who might eventually misappropriate trade secrets, but it's also something to check into if a company is pulled into litigation over hiring an employee who may have misappropriated trade secrets. Um, although it's still an open question at this point whether a new employer could rely on the absence of notice to argue that exemplaries and attorney's fees shouldn't be awarded against it as opposed to not being awarded against the employee. Um, the case law, the DTSA case law is still developing because this is a relatively new law. Uh, most of the decisional case law hasn't moved beyond the motion to dismiss or preliminary injunction stage, but obviously this is a developing area of the law to keep a close eye on. So I'll turn it over now to Maritoni who will discuss common law claims that can arise from hiring um, an employee who's subject to a restrictive covenant. Great. Thanks, Lori. So as Lori mentioned uh, in the beginning, there's a number of potential state law claims that can be brought against the departing employee or your new employee if you're the new employer or for you. And here on this slide is a laundry list of those. Breach of contract, tortious interference with contract, tortious interference with economic advantage, unfair trade, unfair competition, and rating. Now, in the next slide, I'll have some examples of cases in which these types of claims have been brought. And they actually involve allegations and facts in which the new employer played more of an active role in interfering with the former employer's business. So they'll be useful as well when we get to the discussion of the breakup phase. The first one is Hamedica versus Oceanic. Um, Hamedica is a company which develops, manufactures, and sells orthopedic implants, instruments, and other products and services. And it had empl it, it employees sign confidentiality, intellectual property, non-competition, and non-solicitation agreements upon hire. Now, a number of the employees left um, Hamedica to go to a competitor. And then the former employer brought suit against six former employees and the former employee's new employer for injunctive relief. They brought claims against the new employer and ex-manager for corporate rating and for tortious interference with contract. They brought claims against the ex-employees for breach of contract and they brought claims against everyone for tortious interference with prospective economic advantage and unfair competition. Now, according to the docket, there's been motion to dismiss briefing, there's been an emergency motion for, for order to show cause for temporary restraining order, there's been a preliminary injunction and expedited discovery motions, and bottom line, while the case is still pending, the new employer is now faced to invest a lot of time and money in defending the case. The next case is Balmer versus Frank Crystal and Company, which I'll refer to as FCC. Uh, Balmer engaged in the business of insurance brokerage and it had its employees enter into employment agreements which contained a non-solicitation provision prohibiting the employees from soliciting Balmer's customers and active prospects, from inducing Balmer's clients from terminating or canceling insurance coverage or failing to renew their coverage, and from disclosing customer lists and policy information. Some of the employees left Balmer and they began enticing employees to 
a competing agency and opened up a new office for that competing agency. And they also began soliciting Balmer customer and clients. Balmer brought a 11 count complaint with, as you see, a laundry list of claims against the new employer and ex-employees. And based on the facts of the case, the trial court entered a verdict in favor of Balmer on nine out of 11 of the claims and awarded $2.4 million in compensatory damages and $4.5 million in punitive damages. The defendants appealed in the damages award and the award was upheld on appeal. Now, interesting, the court found that the revenue that the new employer, FCC, apparently received from Balmer um, agency clients in that first year of business was approximately $300,000. I, I would argue that the actions by the new employer were not worth the risk of this $6.9 million award. In Getty Images, uh, this involved a stock photo company and a former employer, uh, former executive, sorry, worked, who had worked at Getty for 16 years, resigned, and basically told Getty that, I'm sorry, she signed a non-disclosure agreement at the start of her employment. She eventually resigned, saying she wanted to take off time uh, to rest and spend with her family. Weeks later, uh, Getty found out that she was working for a rival company. They filed a complaint, again, with a laundry list of claims against the executive, alleging that she had shared Getty trade secret and confidential information with her new employer. Now, the complaint this time is only against the employee and not the new employer. And so far, the court has ordered the former employee to turn over Getty trade secrets and confidential information, and they restrained her from unfairly competing. They also ordered her to hand over electronic devices used since before, long before she actually submitted her resignation, along with passwords for email accounts and messaging applications. And again, I focus on the complaint is only against the employee and not the new employer, but I raise this because I was involved in a similar situation with a client in which the new employee's former employee sued only the employee. But during the course of that litigation, um, the new employee's computer was reviewed and there were preliminary indications that it contained certain confidential code. So the former employer wanted to know whether that employee shared the code with the new employer and therefore they subpoenaed the new employer. So we had to go through um, electronic discovery and a lot of ESI and produce that. We also had to negotiate a third party forensic review of the materials on the computer because at that time you have to consider as the new employer, you need to make sure to protect your own confidential information and trade secrets. So we spent a lot of time trying to negotiate the terms of the third party forensic review. What are you looking at? What are you looking at at ours? Make sure not to look when you identify it, that it is our materials. We don't want you to delve into that. And again, bottom line, just responding to the subpoena as well as to negotiating the forensic review um, took a lot of time and money. Uh, but thankfully the case was eventually dismissed. And I think Lori has another uh, example. Yes, I, I do. And this is an example where both the employees and the new employer were sued. Um, it, it, last month, uh, insurance broker Assured Partners agreed to pay $20 million in settlements of one of its competitors called Brown & Brown, uh, claims that it Assured and several employees that it had hired away from Brown and Brown violated restrictions in their previous employment agreements. So Brown and Brown had filed its lawsuit in federal state court claiming that Assured hired eight of its top sales and support staff and then aided those former employees in breaking restrictive covenants in their contracts that prohibited them from soliciting or servicing Brown and Brown customers for two years after leaving the company. Now, the parties litigated through the preliminary injunction stage, and the judge issued a preliminary injunction that prevented the former employees from soliciting or servicing 
for uh, brown and brown customers and also required the uh, individual to divest themselves of accounts that they had procured um, at Assured that were the subject of, of the lawsuits. Um, after the preliminary injunction was issued, the parties ended up settling with Assured, making a $20 million payment and also agreeing not to hire any more of Brown and Brown employees for a certain period of time and to return any of Brown and Brown's confidential business information or trade secrets in its possession. This is reportedly one of the largest uh, settlements in a restrictive covenants case, and I think it just um, reinforces Maritoni's point that not only do you uh, face you know, liability under, under the law, uh, you also face litigation costs when companies are not uh, careful about honoring restrictive covenants and other obligations that, that new employees might have to their former employers. Um, so with that, I will turn to uh, how employers can avoid having to defend against these kinds of claims, um, that they've either misappropriated another company's trade secrets or they've been somehow complicit in a breach of a restrictive covenant. I've got listed on this slide a number of tips and considerations to keep in mind. Uh, the first one started is, is training hiring personnel, both HR staff as well as management employees who may ultimately end up interviewing candidates. Training, training these individuals as to what is a trade secret, what types of non-compete agreements, non-disclosure agreements are common in the industry, what kinds of questions should be asked or not asked in an interview in order to avoid the appearance that um, there's going to be a misappropriation of trade secrets or any other sort of solicitation of customers that could be in violation of, uh, of a restrictive covenant in place. Um, alerting HR and interview, other interviewing personnel to consult with counsel if there's any question whatsoever or if they think there could be a potential issue with respect to trade secrets or other proprietary information. And also reminding hiring personnel to be mindful of what is said in email communications. Um, and in that regard, I'll skip down a couple of points on the slide and go out of order. You know, most employers monitor email communications. So when I say uh, train people to be mindful of what is said in email communications, I'm talking about email communications with the applicant as far as what sort of information you're soliciting about the person's history and job responsibilities with the company and what sort of information they've learned while being at the company or if there's other candidates who may be um, interested in coming over with them, those sorts of considerations because, as I said, employers do monitor their email systems and, and uh, if anything if an employer suspects that there may be some sort of breach of covenant, you can be sure that they'll be going through through emails in the computer system to see if they can get evidence. In fact, I had recently had a case a couple of years ago where we had some really good smoking gun evidence about um, uh, uh, pre-high-level executive trying to um, solicit his coworkers to leave the company with him to go to someplace else that he has uh, accepted a job to in violation of his employment agreement. And so um, that can be pretty powerful evidence. So be careful when using email. Train employees to be careful when using email. And also internal communications can be will be discoverable if there's ever litigation as well. So um, hiring personnel need to be conscious about what they're saying to each other, even on internal emails. Um, and just one other uh, consideration is that emails with headhunters who may be helping out with the recruiting and interview process, those um, communications can be discoverable as well if there's ever litigation. So um, training, training hiring personnel about, about email is important. Um, in that regard, going back up uh, to the second bullet point here, establishing a protocol for identifying potential uh, trade secrets and proprietary information related issues. What fact investigation should be done on applicants concerning restrictive covenants? What acknowledgments applicants 
could be under certain circumstances required to sign as they go through the interview process, um, acknowledging that they won't disclose any trade secret or proprietary information to the potential new employer during the interview process. What types of warnings and reviews should be conducted during the interview process to avoid any sort of appearance or argument that, that during the interview process, you're trying to get competitors know-how or, or trade secrets. Um, conduct due diligence on candidates. Uh, Maritoni will talk more specifically about this in just a moment, but in general, it's important to determine what restrictive covenants or other agreements could be in place that would pertain to the candidate's employment with you. Um, and when you're considering a candidate, remember that there are common law obligations imposed on employees as well, depending on their position within the company, and that could include a duty of loyalty. Um, there's also trade secret law that I've talked about with respect to the DTSA and related state laws, the doctrine of inevitable disclosure that I talked about earlier. Um, and then, Consider addressing trade secret and confidential information in the offer letter. So an offer letter might clearly state uh, that the, the prospective employee is prohibited in the use of the former employer's confidential and trade secret information, and a reminder to the employee or prospective employee that uh, he or she must continue to honor obligations of trust and confidentiality or any other applicable obligation that he or she may have to the former employer. Um, companies might also consider after offer acceptance, doing, sending a follow-up letter reminding the person to return all confidential information to the former employer before start date of this new job, um, to return all property to the former employer, computers, any mobile devices, thumb drives, um, uh, remove any of that and, and return it to the former employer before the start date of the new job. And finally, um, if there's going to be any press releases uh, announcing a new, a new person joining the company, pay attention to the wording of that press release. Avoid focusing on the executive's experience at the competitor or any specific skills that could only be gained at the competitor because that's obviously going to be public information that if there's a concern about an employee leaving and going to a competitor, it will be um, very... Uh, highly scrutinized. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maritoni. Excellent. Thanks, Lori. And in the next couple of slides, I'm going to touch on some of the items that Lori mentioned, but um, in detail with some, and then skim through some other ones. So, you know, conducting due diligence on your candidate, know who you're courting. So what are those not-so-sexy issues a new employer should flush out about their candidate? You know, what is the candidate's job title? What are all of the candidate's responsibilities? How much decision-making authority does, they, does the candidate have? Where do they sit in the corporate hierarchy? How much customer contact does the candidate have, and what is the scope of that contact? And how much does the candidate know about the former employee's, employer's secret sauce? Also, as Lori mentioned, you know, make sure all the cards are on the table. Go through what kind of existing employment agreements or restrictive covenants are out there, and consider tying full disclosure of those types of agreements to an offer of employment or assistance with the defense of potential claims. Consider uh, securing legal counsel to conduct an analysis of the existing restrictive covenants. We'll talk about restrictive covenants later on. Um, but they typically review their enforceability as to the type, type of the scope uh, and, and during the legal analysis. And one key thing which assists in evaluating risk is consider investigating the former employer's prior enforcement actions. So they really run the gamut of uh, we've seen as to um, no enforcement action, whatever, whatsoever, um, regardless of maybe a blatant breach, uh, weak threats with no follow-up, a very deliberate enforcement, or basically scorched earth enforcement. And so knowing 
knowing the market in this regard will inform you of your risk appetite as a new employer. And in um, the matter of Hometica that I um, mentioned, uh, the case against FTC, and that was only one case in a number of cases that that particular employer and its parent company brought against numerous competitors. So again, if that's the climate you're in, uh, you should be extra diligent and careful in uh, working with your new candidate, your new employee. Uh, as Lori mentioned, make sure to paper the new relationship. Uh, with various warranties and representations, and these work very well uh, to the extent that you're a new employer and you get, uh, get a communication from a former employer, you know, demanding uh, what's going on with that person you just hired. You know, have the employee warrant that their accepting employment will not violate any existing relationship, that they will not use the former employer's confidential information and trade secrets, and basically, a statement that the company represents that it is not asking that employee to disclose any confidential information or trade secrets from the former employee, from the former employer. Also, consider assigning work in non-competitive departments or areas um, and setting up information barriers. Again, each of these steps protects a new employer from suit by a former employer. Also, one thing that new employers never think about is how is a new employee going to break up with their old employer? They say, great, you've accepted employment, we'll see you on X date. But make sure the breakup with the old employer isn't messy. Consider advising your candidate to give proper notice, to not copy or dump files to home computers, to return all company property and files, to not divert opportunities, to not solicit company, customers, to not start work early on your behalf. Basically, act professionally. In those other cases that I discussed earlier, in large part, there was typically, the most common thing that, you'd thought that we saw in the cases is uh, copying and dumping files to home computers right before the candidate left. And again, as Lori said, there is a trail to be um, found there. And uh, in each of those cases, they were dumping contracts and customer lists and different things like that and sending to them to their home computers, um, as well as reaching out to some um, customers of theirs while they were still employed and telling, about, telling them about their new opportunity. So this concludes our discussion of the first phase, the courtship phase, and now we want to work, uh, move into the breakup phase and discuss how to protect yourself when an employee is departing your employment. With that interlude, we'll go to the breakup phase. Okay, so even though we're moving on to the breakup phase, um, it's important to think about this phase really at the beginning of the relationship. Um, and enter into appropriate agreements with your new employees that will protect you when they eventually leave and move on to a new employer. So those agreements um, include confidentiality and non-disclosure agreements, non-solicitation or no-hire agreements, non-compete agreements, and then there also are a number of um, employment policies that we'll talk about that are important to have in place, um, sort of have employees acknowledge them when they begin working for you, have them acknowledge them throughout the employment, and then remind employees of the policies as they're on their way out the door. Um, and so the first thing I think we're going to talk about uh, are, are some of these agreements, and Maritoni will go into more specific detail about them. So with regard to the, the scope of the agreements, when I think about these restrictive covenants, confidentiality, non-solicitation, non-compete, I usually view them in a spectrum. And typically, non, non, the confidentiality agreements you know, are given less scrutiny and more readily enforced, uh, going to the other end of the spectrum where you get into non-compete agreements. So with regard to confidentiality, 
confidentiality or non-disclosure agreements, again, they're generally given uh, less scrutiny. But keep in mind that there are various provisions and laws which require uh, careful drafting of the agreements in order to find them enforceable. Many of you may be familiar with um, Section 21F of the Dodd-Frank um, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act and um, the case of in the matter of KBR. In that case, the SEC aggressively targeted confidentiality agreements that might discourage whistleblowing. KBR required employees who internally reported potentially illegal or unethical actions to execute confidentiality agreements, and the agreement prohibited the employees from discussing the substance of the report with the company without the prior approval of the company. And the SEC determined that the agreement violated um, the Securities Exchange Act, and it fined KBR and required it to add language to its confidentiality agreements, specifically exempting whistleblowing communications. So again, um, even with your confidentiality provisions, even though there's generally arguably less scrutiny, there are still things to keep in mind. And not only should you keep in mind SEC concerns, there are a number of different agencies also that have been challenging confidentiality provisions. And those include the EEOC as well as the NLRB. The NLRB have challenged confidentiality provisions in separation agreements. The NLRB has been hot on the trail of confidentiality provisions in employee handbooks. And also, as Lori had mentioned earlier, there's a DTSA whistleblower immunity provision where notice needs to be given. So the key is to make sure to know the law and be careful with regard to your drafting. With regard to non-solicitation and no-hire agreements, again, to me it's less scrutiny. Uh, you're moving on the spectrum here, but keep in mind that various no-hire provisions have been found to be unenforceable. Here is an example in California. Um, BLS had a short-term computer consulting contract with Star Trek Strength. There was a no-hire provision, and Star Trek agreed to not hire any BLS employees for 12 months, and for Star Trek to pay liquidated damages if they hired anyone. And an employee of BLS responded to an Internet ad and was hired by Star Trek. BLS filed suit and demanded that Star Trek pay liquidated damages. The trial court initially enforced the no-hire provision, but on appeal, the ruling was reversed, and the court relied on the California Business and Professions Code provision noted there, which, which um, provides that any contract which restrains anyone from engaging in, the lawful, in a lawful trade or business is unenforceable in California. And in this instance, the court found the restraint too broad because it impacted the freedom of mobility of the individuals. Now, in California, some narrower no hires may be still valid, but keep in mind that no hire provisions will be highly scrutinized under California law. Also, uh, no solicitation agreements with regard to customers. Um, Edwards was a situation in which a tax manager signed a non-solicitation clients uh, provision, and that was supposed to run for 18 months. That, that was supposed to run with regard to clients that he had contact with during the 18 months preceding the termination. There are many complicated facts in this case, but the validity of non-solicit was challenged, and while the trial court upheld it, the Court of Appeals reversed it, and basically in reversing it, rejected a long line of authority in the Ninth Circuit, allowing for narrow restraints on post-employment conduct, and very strictly applied the California Business and Professional Code section. In Novus, this is the New York case, actually, which struck down a non-solicitation agreement, which would have prohibited a former employee from dealing with any company customer, whether or not the individual had a relationship with that uh, client at the company. And again, just to keep in mind, know where you are and be very careful with the drafting of your restrictive covenants 
so that they are deemed enforceable. Non-compete agreements, they fall under the spectrum under the greatest, they usually get the greatest scrutiny. And for this, you want to find out, you know, are your non-competitions enforceable under state law? If you're in California, you're basically out of luck. Um, there are some states, however, that have particular state statutes that govern the enforceability of a non-compete. And I give some examples there, which it's clearly laid out in the statute what is deemed reasonable, what can be, you know, what is okay with regard to a non-competition agreement, and in others it's based on case law. And here I have examples, uh, like if you are in Illinois or New York. You should know also in enforcing um, restrictive covenants, uh, non-competes in particular, you know, what does your state identify as a protectable interest? And here we have a number of uh, items that are listed from anything from confidential information and trade secrets, customer relations, and its variations. And by that, I mean with regard to particular states, some talk about customer relationships in general, some talk about you know, near permanent customer relationship, so it really, they really dive into what type of relationship it is and how long it's been present between the parties, certain customer lists and contacts, and again, companies look at whether um, what efforts a company might have invested into preparing a customer list or whether it was commonly known what the customer lists and contacts are out there in the market space. Um, specialized skill, goodwill, but one thing that is commonly not found to be a protectable, protectable interest is ordinary competition. Another issue in, you want to make sure of in drafting your non-compete agreements to make sure that they're enforceable is, is the non-compete supported by sufficient consideration? Um, sufficient consideration could be money, that's very um, obvious. And for a long time, states and certain states have basically said continued employment is sufficient consideration. And I give an example down below, Georgia, New York, Missouri, where a restrictive covenant entered into at the beginning of the relationship or when there are changes in employment um, or continued employment. So changes in employment might be a promotion um, and or a raise and then continued employment have typically been found to be sufficient consideration. Um, in Illinois, for example, um, that recently changed in 2013. Uh, Fifield is a case that uh, where an employee entered into a non-solicit, non-compete for two years. The employee only worked there for three months and then worked for, resigned and worked for a competitor. And he and his new employer argued that the covenant not to compete was not valid because it was not supported by sufficient consideration because he had only worked there for three months. Uh, the court agreed and the court found that continued employment for a substantial period of time beyond the threat of discharge is sufficient to support restrictive covenant, to re support a, <coughs> excuse me, a restrictive covenant. And the court put, actually put a two-year time frame on it. Now, cases since um, Fifield in Illinois uh, have, for the most part, relied on that kind of two-year benchmark, but they have not abandoned uh, a fact-specific inquiry. And uh, some of the cases after Fifield have also looked at whether additional consideration uh, provided to employ an employee um, can lessen the two-year basically continued employment requirements established by the field. Other aspects to consider as to making your non-compete um, enforceable is have you drafted it such that it's reasonable in scope, geographically, temporally, and or, and or does your state recognize an activity or customer restriction? Another thing to keep in mind is will the courts in your state modify an overbroad non-compete? And again, there's a full range of what courts will do uh, given the particular state. 
there are certain states that blue pencil or strike out what a court might deem to be overbroad. There are some states that actually modify um, overbroad restrictive covenants to make them more reasonable. There are some states that basically will not make any change and will find that if a provision is overbroad, it will be found unenforceable. There are other states that kind of take a hybrid approach. So if they find that the restrictive government covenant was made with bad intent, they'd strike it all. But if uh, basically it's unreasonable in some aspects, they might modify it. And of course, other states are undecided. Uh, also something to keep in mind is what happens if you, the employer, terminates the employment relationship? Will the covenant not to compete still be enforced? And again, you can see here that there is a range of um, what a state might be, what, what they might do with regard to the restrictive covenant. They might still enforce the restrictive covenant. Uh, they might still enforce the restrictive covenant except if the termination was a result of bad faith by the employer, or the employee committed a prior employer committed a prior breach, or they won't enforce the restrictive covenant if the employee was terminated without cause, or if the contract was otherwise breached. Some other things to keep in mind with regard to non-compete agreements. Um, Recently, Jimmy Johns has been challenged in both New York and Illinois by the state's attorney generals, finding that they can't justify using the non-competes as a condition of employment because its employees just aren't subject to trade secrets or confidential information. And Jimmy Johns settled the issue with New York and stopped using non-competes pursuant to the settlement. And in Illinois, actually, there was a development based on this, the Illinois Freedom to Work Act, which went into effect January 1st. And basically, that prohibits non-governmental workers from entering into covenants not to compete with low-wage employees. And low-wage employees are those that earn less than the greater of um, the hourly rate equal to the minimum wage required under applicable federal, state, or minimum wage law, or $13 per hour. And basically, the covenant's not to compete. You cannot enter into those in Illinois with any of these individuals with that wage level uh, to prevent them from working for another employer for a specific period of time, to preventing them to work in a specific geographical area, or to work for another employer that's similar to um, the low-wage low earners work for the prior employer. Any such um, non-compete agreement entered into that individual will be deemed illegal and void. So again, know the law and be careful with your drafting. And with that, I'll turn that over to Lori to discuss policy. Thanks. So in addition to the specific agreements that Maritoni just discussed, it's important to have policies in place that establish what employees can and cannot do with regard to um, an employer's trade secrets and other confidential information during the course of employment. So having these policies in place not only has the benefit of establishing expectations for conduct up front, uh, the policies can also serve as a reminder at the end of the relationship of an employee's obligations as he or she is, is going out the door. And so on this slide, I've listed a number of policies that are important to have in place related to protection of an employer's proprietary information. First and foremost, of course, is a confidentiality policy um, that should include language about a continuing obligation of confidentiality even after the employee leaves the employer. Um, but remember the DTSA immunity provision notice that I requirements that I discussed earlier in the presentation. If you've got a confidentiality policy, that notice, consider whether you should have that notice in there. Um, and also government agency concerns that Mayor Tony referenced earlier in the presentation. You want to be clear that you're not trying to prevent your employees from 
going to government agencies and complaining about potential violations of the law. Bring your own device policies. Um, this, for purposes of protecting confidential information, the policy should set forth what's acceptable and not acceptable use of personal devices for work purposes, and also should provide the employer with the ability to inspect devices and, abil and the ability to remotely wipe those devices if, if it becomes necessary, particularly at the end of the employment relationship. Acceptable use policies, which generally establish rules surrounding use of the company's electronic resources like computer systems and the internet and, and other networks. Um, Key provisions of this policy should in include a notice to employees that all activity conducted on the company systems will be monitored, prohibit use of personal email for work purposes, prohibit the use of cloud, the cloud unless it's done pers pursuant to an established protocol that's been approved by the employer, and prohibit downloading of any company information, things like thumb drive, disks, any other means of removable uh, uh, electronic information. And finally, social media policies should address ownership of corporate social media accounts. There's been some litigation when an employee leaves and doesn't provide a password to the corporate social media account, and then all of a sudden the employer can't, doesn't have access to contacts and customer lists that are on social media. Um, Social media policies also should include a reminder about posting of sensitive company information on social media accounts. A few years ago, there was a, an executive who, in advance of his public company announcing its quarterly results, put up a message on his Facebook page about, about positive results or being happy about the performance of the company and got in trouble with the SEC for making that statement on, on his Facebook account. So, um, these policies are important to remind employees about how, what their conduct should be. Moving now to uh, the end of the employment relationship and steps to take when your employee is walking out the door. I'll turn it over to Mira Tony. Great. And unfortunately, we're going to fly through these slides because we have run out of time. But it kind of comes full circle. So just as a new employer should find out about what their new candidate has, as a employer of an almost departing employee, you should make sure to know what's in place. Um, beware of the restrictions in place, what you have, and again, this takes coordination sometimes between HR and management, um, making sure what's out there, providing the employee with a copy of the agreements in place, making the employee return everything that they have, and basically, you're planting um, the seed to the employee, let's not make this a bad relationship uh, as you depart. So then other actions to consider beyond simply reminding the departing employee about continuing obligations, um, depending on the circumstances, uh, include conducting a forensic investigation of the departing employee's computer system activity for things like unusual downloads, large email attachments, and, you know, the timing of this, uh, of conducting such an investigation is really going to depend upon the circumstances. Probably best to do it before an employee walks out the door and still is accessible to you or more accessible to a company, but close to the time of departure because employees tend to do things at the very last minute right before they're going to leave if they're going to take any information. Um, this is where the monitoring policy uh, that I referenced previously becomes important in, in companies' ability to go in and look at what's being done on its computer system. And I know some companies will do this kind of investigation as a matter of course when employees in certain positions leave just to make sure that they're not downloading the blueprints for some upcoming um, technological advance that, that the company hasn't released yet. Remember to disable employee access to employer systems um, upon termination so that the employee can't come in after he or she leaves the company and download information um, in a way that you, you might not be able to, to really monitor or access. And then where appropriate, draft continuing obligation letters. Um, uh, to the former employee and or the new employer reminding the new employer and the former employee of the continuing obligations that the employee might have. And if you become aware of any information that you think that 
the employee or the new employer are now in violation of any existing agreement, you might have to escalate to a cease and desist letter to both the former employer and the new employee former employee and new employer and make sure to include a litigation hold notice in those letters so that nothing is destroyed uh, while you further investigate what might be going on. And, and instead of um, moving forward into complete litigation, you might want to consider any type of informal agreements with the former employee and or employer. But of course, if you cannot do that, there is always the option of litigation. And again, we talked about the various cases, so you get a flavor of what is involved in those cases and the type of claims. Um, and again, there are advantages and disadvantages to litigation, uh, time and money, but also it might be uh, absolutely necessary to protect your company. And again, there might be uh, opportunities for formal or informal settle settlement um, during the course of the litigation. Um, unfortunately, we have no time for um, to respond to the questions. We will seek to get back to you um, offline uh, to the extent that you would like further information. But we thank you very much for joining us today. And make sure to enter into your CLE information. Thanks, Mayor Tony. If you have any, if, if any participants have additional questions related to today's topic, please email them to A Keating, that's A K E A T I N G, at mayorbrown.com, and your questions will be promptly forwarded to Mayor Tony and me. Thanks again to everybody for your participation today, and have a great day.